Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here. I'm, I'm Tom Gershon. I'm a member of the Adult Education uh, Committee here at uh, Claremont United Church of Christ. And uh, in that capacity, it's my pleasure to welcome our speaker today, uh, Dr. Daisy Acampo. Uh, uh, Dr. Acampo is Assistant Professor of History at California State University, San Bernardino. Uh, where she teaches classes on U.S. history and history research methods. Uh, Dr. Acampo holds a Ph.D. in history with a concentration in Native history from the University of California, uh, Riverside, rooted in quote-unquote decolonial methodologies. Her research examines collective memory as enacted through two sacred indigenous sites. Uh, and I'm going to do my best with the pronunciation here, <laughs> Daisy. Uh, Mama Pukaib, or the Old Woman Mountains in the East Mojave Desert. That's right. And uh, Tlakia Loyan Tepec. Tlakia Loyan Tepec, yes. Thank you. Uh, or uh, Cerro de las Ventanas in Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, not only does the work contribute to memory studies by spotlighting important native histories, it also challenges traditional notions of how sites of memory operate by emphasizing not just historical events, what happened to whom and when, but also the way embodied cultural values and knowledges, what Acampo calls, quote, performative and phenomenological insights, how those as well might be preserved. Dr. Campos' presentation today is on the Sherman Indian Boarding School in Riverside. Uh, this school was one of hundreds of such schools in the United States, uh, which supported the involuntary assimilation of Native children forcibly removed from their families. Mm -hmm. uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Daisy Acampo. Thank you, uh, Tom. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, and uh, thank you for for having me this morning. I'm happy to be here. And uh, it's really been a pleasure putting this presentation together. Uh, I really did my best to try and uh, provide an overview of Sherman, um, provide some critical background information in terms of how we got boarding schools here in the United States. Um, and then uh, kind of some, some contemporary directions that, that we're taking today, as we know, boarding schools um, is now at the forefront. It is now part of our conversation in terms of really grappling with this part of history. Um, so as Tom mentioned, uh, my name is Dr. Daisy Ocampo. I am a Kashkan uh, native woman from Southern Zacatecas, Mexico. That's where my people and my family are all at. Um, I always like to share a little bit more about, uh, you know, who I am and um, how I got into this work. My family came here to California. Uh, my grandfather as a bracero, um, and then my my father followed suit and kind of ended up at Catalina Island and then to the mainland and to LA. And then I went to school in Riverside. And so here I am. Um, but as a Kashkan woman um, living here in Riverside, which I'm zooming in from the Kuya and Serrano ancestral homelands, I, I really uh, try and make sure that my work is always being um, of service to tribal nations here in our area. Um, and so that is just part of how I like to orient myself as a guest living here in California. So although some of my scholarship is in back is back home in Mexico, um, I always try to make sure that if the tribes or any of the tribal entities here in the area need my support, that I do my best to always show up for them. Um, and so that's how I got into this work on Sherman. So Sherman is here in Riverside, California. I've known um, a lot of administrators of, you know, uh, at Sherman for a while now. And so in the midst of the pandemic, I was asked to produce a virtual museum um, with my class. Um, so it was my first year teaching at Cal State San Bernardino. 
I was online and I was asked to create a museum to really try and bring the online community together um, and, you know, share more information about Sherman. Um, so this presentation is titled Away From Home, and this is obviously from the perspective of um, the students who were away from home, Legacies of Sherman Indian Boarding School. Um, so here to the right we have, so just a little bit of uh, background on all the photographs that are used in today's presentation. Um, they are found on Calisphere, and I actually helped digitize along with the staff at Sherman Indian Museum, which is a museum dedicated to the school's history, uh, digitize, I want to say about 90% of all the primary sources, letters, photographs, and such that are found there are now online. So I'd be more than happy to share with Tom some of these links. So if anyone wants to continue to do some research on Sherman, um, they'd be able to do that. So a lot of the photographs are gathered from that um, digital resource. Now, let's go ahead and um, get started. Uh, so I wanted to provide some leading questions for our presentation today. Um, the first one, so as we know, uh, boarding schools were these schooling uh, institutions, these, these schools that would take Native students from their home reservations and into these schools. Oftentimes, these schools were located in urban areas. And at these schools, there, you know, in, in a nutshell, right, there was a series of, of assimilation um, you know, processes that took place there. So we'll discuss that today. Um, but the reason why it's also important is that from the early 1900s, from about 1902 to about, gosh, 1960, 90% of Native Americans went through boarding school. 90%. So that lets you know that this was a pretty standard and very common experience in the early 1900s, well into the 1960s. Um, boarding schools are still open today, but this does tell you that this was still fairly recent in the 1960s. And so there are a lot of Native people still today that attend boarding schools or that have had parents that went to boarding schools and even grandparents. Okay, so it's really important for us to understand that that experience so that we have some insight into that history. So the first guiding question that I have for us this morning is how did boarding schools try to shape American belonging? And I say American because the way we're going to be looking at America is through a very colonial lens and through a very settler colonial lens, right? It was in an effort to expand the country at the cost of native communities and livelihoods, which we'll get to in a little bit. Uh, what were the intentions and consequences of these boarding schools? Secondly, how did boarding school experiences reflect broader policies that impacted Native people in the 18th and 19th century? And lastly, how did this legacy of the boarding schools continue to shape people's perspectives today? Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and get to it. I'm gonna be moving my my um, my little camera square around so I can see all my content back here. Uh, so the first tag that I have here is the cost. So I think it's really important to really ask ourselves, how, why did we need boarding schools? What led to boarding schools? Did they just, you know, come out of nowhere? And of course they, they didn't, right? Um, so what we see here today, and I apologize, I'm moving a lot of stuff around because, all right, I'm going to... Um, minimize my my section of the screen here so I can see everything. Um, and so I'd like for us to really start a little bit on the East Coast. Um, so on the East Coast, there is a, a huge move, obviously, to move west, right? So we call this in the field of history, Western, um, Western expansion. Um, this space of the West became known as the West and is right the, the, the center space for a lot of our Western films here in the US. 
Um, it involves uh, settlers in the form of cowboys, in the form of uh, army generals, right? And different military squads that are out to often gain access to land, to resources, move across the West. We usually see this through like desert landscape. Um, and there's usually some form of a native actor involved, right? Um, and oftentimes we see this as um, in the form of warfare. Um, and that it, that is because it, it was. So during the 1860s and during the eight, all the way to the 1890s, there was a series of massacres and wars that took place throughout the West um, that were called the Indian Wars. Now, this time period is really a time period where the army and American settlers, uh, white settlers, right, are really encroaching onto native land. Now, if someone starts encroaching into your space that is home, uh, native people were obviously on guard. Uh, trying to protect their families, trying to protect their homeland and, and their communities, right? They are being pushed out of their homelands. Um, so this gave pretty much the, the premise for these Indian wars. Um, now, uh, famous among one of these, for example, and some of us may be familiar with the Trail of Tears, where um, the... Uh, Cherokee folks, Muscogee people were moved from more or less the what is today the state of Florida and were moved to Indian territory, which is more or less current day uh, Oklahoma state, right? They were forced to march out of their homelands and move to new territory in the snow. Um, there was a lot of, of folks that died in this journey. And of course they were promised land elsewhere. So there was always a, a move to keep pushing tribes and dislocating them further and further west or further and further out until they were kind of either disintegrated or just fully dislocated and had no place of home because they had moved around um, so often. So this map here to the left, we are seeing some military posts. Uh, we are looking at some of the tribal nations here, Modoc, uh, Paiute, Navajo, Ute, Sioux, um, Lakota, Kiowa, and, um, and more. Uh, but we're also seeing a lot of the battle sites with, which are just pinpointed throughout the map. So it gives you a pretty good idea of what the, what the climate was at this time. Now, a lot of uh, this move west was very uh, racialized. A lot of the settlers moving west, for example, were using travel guides on how to make it out west to California. A lot of folks were trying to make it to, to California. Um, and if you read a lot of these travel guides, um, you know, they will let you know, you know, if you if you see an Indian, just shoot them, right? Just kill them before they kill you. Um, and so we what we see is um, a huge attack on native people and their sovereignty and, and their homelands at this time. Um, so what is important, um, I, I, I included, I don't know how many of you have seen this image here at the bottom, right? Um, it's a famous one and it is, um, I believe they call her Columbia and she's moving west. Um, she's carrying a telegraph wire here, right? So it's supposed to really connect uh, Eastern uh, United States with Western United States. So it was meant to kind of build this connectivity, this connection between the two, be, you know, with roads, uh, with trains, with telegraph. So it was supposed to integrate um, the United States in that way. Um, we also see here, that we see, of course, the wagons of settlers moving west. Uh, we can see the trains here. And what's interesting is here at the bottom, we see people already working the land. So this is really supposed to represent that once you kind of make it over the river and really across the west, that you can have your plot of land, farm, you know, have your, um, your animals. Um, but what you see here are native people uh, running away. And it's really running away from this idea of um, 
manifest destiny was this idea that the settlers were destined right to take over the entire United States. Now, this was the language early on, but now we understand that this really came at a huge cost, right? We have a lot of recent uh, Native communities, a lot of young Native people that are really trying to reshift how we see a lot of these images. So for example, we had one uh, Native student that went from, you know, using uh, Columbia here, which is, I believe, what they uh, termed the woman, and really put this haunting image, right, that was kind of sweeping the West. And this is really trying to shift the way we see this, um, this perspective of bringing civilization to the West, right, because it was a very scary thing for Native people. Um, so, uh, there is this piece of Western schooling that I added here. What does schooling have to do with this whole process here? Um, and I, I'm gonna get that. I'm gonna get uh, to the next slide with, with that question. But as we talk about schooling and boarding schools uh, in the United States, I want to make a, a distinction between schooling as a mechanism to assimilate people into this new. Uh, identity of being American, and then education. So tribal communities had education. There was often these perspectives that Native people were backwards and just didn't know anything, and that's simply not true. Tribal communities had their own curriculum. They had their own educators. Um, obviously, they are not credentialed people through the state, you know, as we have it today, but nonetheless, elders, parents, aunties, and uncles often served uh, in, uh, you know, for this capacity, as well as medicine people. Um, curriculum often included, you know, social sciences. It definitely included geography. Um, it included teachings on religion as well. A lot of our creation stories are very rooted in the land. It talks about how our land and the world came to be and how we came to be as human beings and what it means to be human beings and what it means uh, to be good stewards on this land while we are alive. So these were all, uh, people call these original instructions. These were the instructions that we were given at the time of our creation. So these were all part of the, the, the curriculum, right? The different subjects that were taught to young children. Um, this also included botany, right? You needed to know your land. You needed to know your food systems. You needed to know your irrigation uh, and your medicine that you needed to collect, right? So these were all very important um, teachings uh, for Native communities. Oh. All right, let me move um, my stuff down here. Um, so as we have warfare, we have massacres and we have a huge amount of native people displaced from your land. Um, people are left pretty much trying to figure out how to survive. And what happens is that you have the US Army and settler communities that are starting to form, trying to figure out, well, what are we going to do with all these native people, right? You know, it, partially it's what, from a, just a very humane uh, point of view, what are we going to do with all these native people that we displaced? That's more the humane question. However, there was a real threat that native people would reorganize and attack the US Army or attack settler communities that were starting to form. Um, now, people at this time, and by people, I mean the US Army and settlers that were moving west, they had some really dangerous stereotypes of Native people that often co uh, costed their lives, right? So um, a lot of settlers, including the army, saw them as savages, right? That their lifestyle was just absolutely backwards, that their culture made no sense in the U.S. conception, um, that they were uncivilized, they were dirty. There's just so, so many journals from this time and from U.S. Army that included these early uh, descriptions of Native people. 
So they really, in a way, represented what they did not want the future of the United States to be, right? So there was essentially, they thought Native people were absolutely unfit and incompatible with what they thought they were building um, in terms of the United States and its growth and its, and its expansion. Now, there were two different um, there was two different perspectives in terms of what to do with Native people or what they called the Indian problem. Now, Theodore Roosevelt in 1901 uh, famously is quoted saying, the only good Indian is a dead Indian. Now, you know, we can put this together. I mean, he his, his strategy and his position is that we need to exterminate all Native people. Um, and extermination is exactly what it is, right? These would be widespread uh, massacres throughout the United States. Now, we can imagine that as the United States is moving west, is expanding, and is feeling like the most powerful country at this time, it's very disturbing um, even for settlers themselves to think of themselves as really being at the forefront of civilization on one hand, and then initiating an extermination campaign on the other, right? The, this is a very ethical and moral uh, debate here. So not a lot of people were really in support of enacting an extermination campaign. Now, there was a second solution that, uh, that was posed, and this was by Richard Pratt. And he said, all the Indian there is in the race should be dead. Kill the Indian in him and save the man. Now, what he proposed is let's, let's uh, separate all these aspects that we feel are backwards, their language, their culture, their knowledge system, their creation stories. Let's rip that away from them. And let's just save the physical human being and let's get them as close as possible to a blank slate, right? This kind of empty vessel that then we can drop these new identities and languages that we want to instill in them, such as speak English, right? We need you to work, you know, the farm and leave your, you know, your different um, working systems. We need you to leave your religion and use ours, right? So that that was really the perspective of R Richard Pratt. Now, Richard Pratt was uh, received a lot more support than Roosevelt, right? At least it was not an extermination campaign. So they saw Richard Pratt's solution a little bit more palatable. Um, so Richard Pratt became the first um, superintendent of Carl Al, uh, in Industrial Institute. So as you see here on the left, I'm going to just very briefly go through three different very important stages in, uh, of how we got to Sherman based on this background information. So Richard Pratt was uh, the superintendent of Carl Al. And let me just go ahead and move this over. Now, Carlisle is in uh, Pennsylvania, and it was a school that became a model. And I do mean literally they found a formula for off-reservation boarding schools across the U.S. and Canada. Now, if you all remember just last year, right, they found a lot of human remains in Canada. They found a lot of human remains in the U.S., and it's not a coincidence, right? They all used the same model at this time. Um, so this school operated from 1879 to 1918, and initially it enrolled 10,000 uh, students before the school just started replicating itself throughout the United States. Um, the reason why it's an off-reservation boarding schools, they wanted to take the children away from their home communities, away from their families, and away from their land base, and put them in urban areas which they hoped would continue to grow and boom in the future, but they were really looking to isolate the children from their families, right? They thought that that was a major feature in the success of the school. 
So with Carlisle in mind, they began replicating a lot of different schools uh, throughout the US. Now, the first school that replicated in California is Paris Indian School. So I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with Paris, California, probably 15, 20 minutes away here from where I'm at in, in Riverside. Um, so this is a photograph of Paris Indian School uh, when the building was complete. As you can see, this was still very much a, a new town at the time. There was not much going on. The, the land is pretty desolate and um, it's out in the middle of nowhere. So the school ran from 1892 to 1902. So that's really only 10 years. So you may wonder why only 10 years? Well, as we see, there's not much happening. And the superintendent and the administrators wanted something bigger for the school. Um, However, at Paris Indian School, this was really the first of taking children away from their families. Um, you know, again, they couldn't speak their language at the school. Uh, but very quickly, the administrators, at least on paper, argued that the school uh, experienced a lot of um, experienced a, a water shortage at the school and therefore needed to move to Riverside, California. Now, uh, Riverside, California was a lot bigger, right? Um, and the administrators really wanted, or at least scholars suspect that the administrators strategically moved to Riverside so that they could connect more with philanthropists, with a lot of industries that were booming in Riverside, such as the citrus industry, the cat, <coughs> excuse me, the canning industry in Banning, um, the Mission Inn, Mission Inn and River and, and Sherman, uh, the Institute were very, very close. They had a very close economic partnership. As a matter of fact, the site in Riverside where Sherman is located was actually formerly part of the family of, of, the, of the family of the Mission Inn, um, Frank Miller. So there, there's very strong ties there. Okay, so 10 years at Paris, and then they make the big jump to Sherman, which is in Riverside, California. Now, Sherman Institute, under this name, operated from 1902 to 1970. Now, it didn't stop in the 1970s, but it did rename itself uh, during the civil rights, which I will get to a little bit further down. Uh, and what happened during this time, as I mentioned, the Office of Indian Affairs would send representatives to reservations to essentially remove the children from their families. Now, at, at, at Sherman, the youngest was about three years of age, and the oldest was about 18. So they were very, very tiny. Um, so you may ask, how is it that parents would just give away their kids? How, what did this transaction look like? So what happened during this time is when a representative from the Office of Indian Affairs would go to the reservation communities, if the, the, if the parents refused to send their children, then they would be incarcerated and sent to prison under essentially the crime of unfit parenting because they don't know, quote unquote, what's best for them. There is a very sad case of Hopi native uh, parents that were actually sent to Alcatraz uh, State Prison because they refused and fought to the end to not send their children to boarding schools. Um, so they were pretty much stuck between a hard place, right? Um, a rock and a hard place. At these schools, um, obviously they were separated from their families, but they were also separated from their siblings. It was not uncommon at Sherman to have siblings attend at the same time and them not realizing that they even had siblings at the school. So that meant that lets us know that there was really some weird communication going on, right? This brother would not know that he had two sisters just you know, in the other dorm. Oftentimes, you know, the uh, policy was they could not interact. Um, something else that would happen is that when the children came to the school, they would receive 
an English name. Um, so oftentimes siblings who maybe were younger didn't realize that their sister had a new name at Sherman and they didn't know that that was their sister. Um, but there are also cases of siblings that would uh, go around the school um, you know, and find ways to see their siblings because they did know that they were there. Church was actually one of these spaces during mass where they would go on Sundays, they were forced to go to church. They would go to mass and they would try and coordinate at the same time that the sibling was there. And that would be, you know, some of the ways that they would try and see their siblings. Um, but also they were, they were separated from their land. And as I mentioned, uh, for us Native people, our land is really what uh, roots us and connects us in our, um, you know, creation um, and our medicine ways and our understanding of the entire world, right? We were created for this land and to take care of the land. In my language, um, I, I would say, for example, no toca daisy. My name is Daisy. That would be the English translation. But in my language, tokat actually means to be planted. Creator planted me in this land, right? And so there, there's a, these descriptions in our language that lets us know that we belong to this land. Um, and obviously that is transmitted through our language, right? Which were prohibited at the school culture like dances and songs and all these things that keep our worldview alive were prohibited okay so there is this video that I wanted to show you all um I actually found it while digitizing um no actually a uh, Cindy Alvitri a Tongva elder found this reference in one of the bulletins the school bulletins and there was a film called Redskins that was, it's a silent film um, that was taped at Sherman. And I believe it was in the night, it was in 1929. Um, so the film was, um, was digitized and preserved luckily. And so I wanted to show this quick clip so that we can get an idea of, of, um, of what this looked like uh, at, at Sherman. So give me one second and I hope that the, the audio works. It's
so with uh, this film, um, this this period early on uh, at at Sherman, um, you know, we can see through this film this idea that they wanted really native students um, to have these new affinities and allegiances to the United States, despite the United States for Native people being this colonial and oppressive, um, you know, government to their communities. Um, but, you know, this is where a lot of the schools get the saluting of the flag, right? For a lot of folks today, this is just part of, you know, being an American citizen as it is today. Um, but its roots is really for Native people, right? Was very difficult to have to make this shift and and really um demonstrate right your allegiance to um to this entity so the effects on native communities this is very very important um i've already gone through some of these um but you know there were kind of three major areas where um um you know three different transformations that took place one is obviously assimilation. They couldn't speak their language. This is where most tribal communities lost their language. Um, if you ask a lot of native people, um, really globally, not just in the United States, back home for us as well, how many of you speak your language? Not many. And if you ask, oh, well, what happened? You know, it, it's a really difficult and invasive question. Well, what happened is schooling. Right, it, the, the language was beaten out of children. And this obviously has a cumulative effect into future generations. Before you know it, you know, everyone's speaking English and they lost access to their language, which is such an important tool in, in grounding ourselves in our identity. Uh, my grandma, they did have similar schools. They were not off reservation schools, but they were day schools, meaning you went to the school and came back uh, by the end of the day. My grandma went to these schools and she lost our language that way. Um, and, and so the, our subsequent generations just got very scattered languages, right? That were very incomplete. And now we're revitalizing and a lot of communities globally are revitalizing, but it has taken a lot to really grapple with these histories first. Um, as you saw in the video, uh, it was a very militarized student life. Uh, students were dressed in uniforms. Um, there was definitely physical punishment. Um, if someone, if you spoke your language, not at Sherman, but at Sherman was often considered some of the better boarding schools. There were other boarding schools where if you spoke your language, they would chop off a finger. That's how bad it was. And that was often uh, in a lot of can Canadian residential schools, that was the case. Um, but right, they, it really tried to create a military structure at the school. Um, actually in Riverside on Sundays, the children would have to do a military par parade uh, where the general public non-native would come. It was like a thing to do on Sundays, come onto Sherman campus and, and parade. Uh, for people and they would raise the flags and kind of demonstrate right their ability to become American citizens and a lot of students as a result during both world wars oftentimes uh, really really uh, joined uh, joined the war efforts but especially during World War II right but they were already familiarized with this structure um, so let's go ahead I know I'm running out of time so um try and be a little bit um, timely. All right, assimilation, we already went through some of this, right? Family separation, couldn't speak the language, sibling uh, separation, hair ordinances. What do I mean by hair ordinances? So as soon as uh, students arrived to the school, they would have, especially the young, well, it was mainly the young men would have their hairs uh, cut off. And a lot of tribal communities had long hair, right? That was traditional. And in an effort to kind of assimilate them and structure them uh, to what was acceptable, uh, they would cut their hair. 
Um, again, the curriculum really enforced allegiance to the United States, right? So there was a move away from severing those ties to their tribal communities. They didn't teach tribal government, you know, that that was just completely out, right? It was about them being participants, active participants and citizens of the United States. Now, I, I do want to point out oftentimes with these narratives around boarding schools, we can often get into this idea that all these things just weighed down on the students, right? And the students just kind of got smothered and smashed by these really oppressive schooling systems. However, students, as we know, are very smart and very sneaky and find ways to, um, to survive and to challenge um, authority. I know my little daughter certainly finds ways of um, you know, getting what she wants when she wants it. Um, and the same thing were with the students at Sherman. So uh, one quick example, Chimwavy. Now the Chimwavy is a tribe located near Lake Havasu. So on the border of Arizona and California. Um, now they, they're somewhat local, right? They didn't come from way out, they, they're here. And when they were brought to the school, they sang these songs. They, uh, they're called salt songs and they were their sacred songs. Obviously they were not allowed to sing these songs, but they found ways to sing the songs. They would first identify who were Chimwavy based on their language that they, uh, that they spoke to each other, you know, hidden from the staff and administrators. And they would find ways to sing the songs, right? Um, and in singing these songs secretly, they managed to be able to preserve them their entire time at Sherman, right? If they were caught, they were punished and they knew that, you know, but they worked hard to, to keep them alive. Now, these, these salt song singers, these are sacred songs for them. And, you know, that's a whole different kind of beautiful story there with the salt songs. But fast forward to after they left Sherman, these graduates and alumni found themselves and they were all kind of um, alumni of uh, boarding school, survivors of boarding schools. And so they found a way to revitalize the song. And it was all the students who had managed to remember the songs and keep listening to the songs the entire time. At one point, there was about 12 singers left and there's thousands of members, but there's about 12 singers left. Today in 2022, there are about 400 salt song singers. And it is thanks to this generation of early uh, students at Sherman who would sing the song secretly that they were able to preserve them into the future and were able to revitalize them. So there was a lot of resistance that took place at Sherman. The outing program is another huge feature of the boarding school. And you have to know this, the outing program, essentially what they wanted to do is how do we get all these Indian students to get to work like the rest of us, right? That, that, that's what they wanted. Um, they wanted to make them productive citizens of the United States. They didn't want them to have their tribal ways and gathering and their food systems. They wanted native students at Sherman to participate in the capitalist economy, right? Um, so Sherman, this is one of the reasons it moved to, to Riverside, right? It was looking to connect a lot of the local labor demands here in the area, mainly citrus, canning, but a lot of uh, service industries. So for a lot of women, this included cleaning, this included childcare, right? Uh, there's a lot of cleaning students that went to do cleaning and housekeeping at the Mission Inn, uh, for example. Uh, the young men, they were in demand in the citru citrus industry, farming, um, uh, construction, um, a lot of the houses in, in Riverside were built by the students actually. Um, so these trades were uh, supported by industries that were often found in the cities. And I included this in, in the wording there. But for example, some women were taught how to do manicure and do hair and curls. Well, these skill sets don't really translate to reservation, right? There's so much impoverishment on the reservation because of these federal policies 
that no one has money for to do manicures and, and pay for manicures. So oftentimes what happens is a lot of students end up staying in Riverside or they end up going to San Diego or to Los Angeles, right? So it kept keeping more and more people in cities and away from their reservation areas. And what this means is if there's unclaimed land by these students, it, get, it, gets, it gets taken, that land. And this is when we start seeing a lot of reservation land shrink, right? Less claim land by the students means different state is starting to take a lot of land. For example, um, cattle industry, they want more land. They just, if there's unclaimed land, they would purchase it for like two bucks. Um, and that's how a lot of land theft happened associated uh, with the boarding school. Um, I do want to mention here, uh, not so much the women, the women often went to like very rich affluent homes, right, often by dignitaries, but the, the young men were often left unsupervised, right, they just were out doing their own thing, making homes and in the citrus, they had, they did a lot better at speaking their language and singing their songs because they were left unsupervised. Uh, and that was a common narrative in a lot of students at Sherman. Now, why boarding schools are such a big thing right now? Well, there's human remains at a lot of boarding schools. Why is that? So there are a lot of epidemics uh, at Sherman as they were across the board at different boarding schools. There's trachoma, tuberculosis, Spanish flu, smallpox, chickenpox, typhoid, and measles and others, but those were the main ones and they were the main reasons that so many children died at Sherman. So it was a combination of poor architectural design, meaning the students were cramped into their dorms, too many students sleeping in one room, not enough ventilation, and you get the rise of different epidemics at Sherman. What we see here at the bottom is actually the first hospital that's built at Sherman. I believe it was built in 1906. Um, but what we see is that there's an even larger need as more and more students are getting sick. So they built a second hospital at Sherman. Now you need to remember that administrators do not want to publicize this, right? Their whole platform is, hey, we are a successful school that is assimilating these native children. Look at us, like we're incredibly successful. So this hospital was really a sore eye for Sherman administrators, right? They had to report all of this to the federal government. Um, what we see here, um, we uh, Sherman did have a, a nursing program and it was, they would have like one doctor, but really what it was is they would grab the young women, teach them some basics uh, and more really uh, in nursing so that they can take care of their own peers. Um, so it was interesting because it, it, in this case with the nursing, uh, the young women had this unique opportunity to learn a trait that was outside of kind of domestic spaces, right? Um, here's one quote by one of the Sherman students, Viola Martinez. She's a Paiute young woman at the time. And she was uh, in her book, she wrote, before I went to Sherman, I used to hear Indian people say that a lot of the children came back dead. In fact, the one time I did go home, it was to escort my cousin to the reservation and he had passed away. Now, what we see here at the bottom is Sherman Cemetery, which is not too far from the campus um, here in Riverside on Magnolia. Now this cemetery uh, has, I believe it's about 80 uh, people that are buried there. N most are students, um, but not all. I believe there's a couple of teachers there. I believe there's a cat that uh, students really love that's buried there. And I believe maybe a couple of tribal members from the community that wanted to be buried there. But it is mainly students that passed away from uh, epidemics. Now that's not to say that the total number of students that died at Sherman is just about 80. It was way more. A lot of students were, uh, their bodies were taken back to the reservation communities if allowed. 
meaning if the reservation, if there was transportation, if the roads were adequate to get there and all those logistics, if they were not, they were buried at, at the school. Um, let's see, um, they, some students also passed away uh, from the outing program. So there would be, you know, just bad oversight at the outing jobs and uh, there would be accidents and they would pass away, okay? Um, so this is kind of really setting the, the scenario really of why we have this, this unique experience of historical trauma uh, re related to native experience at boarding schools and why it is kind of this learned, um, this some learned behaviors that happened at Sherman. One of the one of the responses from a lot of students that went to Sherman is it's very sad, which is that they they didn't learn how to love. So when they had families of their own, they they they. They were replicating the same things that were taught at school, right? Which is order, regimentation, right? No flexibility, which we know that we need in parenting. Um, you know, just loving care. All these things were just, they were skill sets that were not learned, right? And these were just kind of creating these relationships that um, were not the healthiest, right? And they have these roots at the school. Now, lastly, uh, to conclude, there is a major shift that took place at Sherman. It was not uh, terribly bad the entire time. So in the 1970s, uh, which I'm starting somewhere in the middle here, but in the 1970s at the height of the civil rights, Sherman Institute shifted its curriculum from that very oppressive, can't speak your language, can't see your family, to a curriculum that really celebrated um, culture. And I'm kind of gonna go through a timeline of what shifted um, the culture at Sherman. So some of the movements and organization and policies that did that in 1919, it wasn't just the civil rights 1970s and 80s, right? Um, it was way earlier for California Indian people. So for example, in 1919, there's the Mission Indian Federation, and it was this organization largely ran by men uh, that were really looking to center California Indian sovereignty here in, in California at, in a, through a political uh, platform, right? So they wanted to govern themselves as, as they were sovereign entities. They didn't just want to be seen as native people here and there displaced. No, we are sovereign entities. We have treaties and reservations and we need to be respected as government to government. So here's one image of the Mission Indian Federation in front of the Mission Inn having one of their meetings. This is in 1908. Uh, next, we see, and I'm just kind of taking some snapshots here, but 1924, we have a very famous Crow leader. His name is Robert Yellowtail, and he was actually big in the White House, um, and he was very critical to Native Americans gaining citizenship in 1924. If you can imagine that the, uh, Native folks in the U.S. did not get citizenship until 1924, uh, which is is terrible to think of that it happened that late. But Robert Yellowtail, who was a Sherman alumni, was very critical to that, um, that um, access to citizenship. Uh, next, what we start seeing in the 70s, right, which is really when we start getting a lot of public kind of interest and buzz and what's going on with the Native people. You have the occupation of Alcatraz that took place, a uh, former state penitentiary, but it is also this island, a very sacred place for a lot of people up north. Uh, so they took over the island and was they were really looking to make political statements about the current state of affairs. This was often, the occupation was led by a lot of urban native people that were taken again from reservations to urban areas to move them out. Um, and they were making a case for, you know, these are some of the social issues that we need addressed. And one of them 
was education. And one of their cases is that their education was really subpar compared to other schooling systems. You also see the establishment of tribal colleges. And at this time, Sherman shifts its curriculum and becomes Sherman Indian High School. We see the American Indian Religious Freedom Act, which ended the cutting of the hair. Um, and then in the 80s, you see a lot of native languages being taught at Sherman, which is again, shifting the, um, the narrative. And finally, what we saw last year, Secretary of the Interior, Deborah Holland, launches the Federal Indian Boarding School Initiative and identifies Sherman Cemetery as a site of inquiry. And so that is really where we find ourselves uh, today. So I'd like to go ahead and end there. They, they are supposed to release um, the results of these findings. So I'm pretty sure that at some point this year, we're going to hear back uh, from Deb Holland about the outcomes of that investigation. So with that, I'd like to conclude and thank you all very much for your time and thank Tom. And Tom, I don't know if um, you want to just conclude here or if there's any questions, I'm more than happy to take those as well. I, I thank you so much, Daisy. That was, that was really wonderful. And, and very interesting. I, I wish we had uh, more time for questions, but actually uh, service is, is just starting now. So. Oh, perfect timing then. Thank you. Thank you so much. Of course, thank you all very much and have a good rest of your day. You too. Bye -bye. Take care.